practitioners and as m mostly, I think, human beings. Is that correct? Yeah? Mostly. Mostly, okay. Any non-human beings at the moment? Just want to make sure. Sorry? Oh, Stan, right where's the Stan? Yeah, he's around somewhere. So mostly human beings, maybe some invisible beings, who knows? And we've come to, spare, to share a few hours together. Uh, some very old friends are here. Some very new friends are here. And one thing that I would like to do before we start the teaching today is I would like everybody to make a new friend. Because look, like the main theme of this, this, uh, this day is that basically you're all going to die and you're going to die alone. Okay? <laughs> so we might as well make a friend along the way. Okay? Does that sound like a good idea? So what I want to do is just in one minute, I'm going to ask everyone to get up and go walk across to the other side of the room, find someone you don't know and give them something. Okay, like a physical gift that you have on you right now. If you don't want to participate, then that's fine. But if you can, if something you've got on you right now, hopefully a physical thing that you can give to that other person. And remember, this is like real. So if you give them your car keys, that's it. Oh, hang on. Sorry, this is New York, right? No one has cars. Okay, if you give them your phone or house keys, that's it. So, and so, when, when we did this, this is recently in, in, in California, and they're like, oh, I, I gave the person meta. No, that's not good enough. <laughs> All right? That's cheating. Okay? So, no, you can give meta as well, but you've got to actually give them something. All right? Is that all right? Everyone happy to do that? Okay, so let's do that. Let's go. when the uh, like at Munra Bodhnyana like every year the the uh, uh, cancer support group comes and he's like really happy because he can tell the same jokes as last year <laughs> oh goodness yeah oh. <laughs> 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 
Sorry, he tells that joke as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, okay, fine. Sorry about that. Monastic humor. Okay, so five aggregates. Okay, so Uh, okay, so <laughs> right. So we're talking about the fact. So before we start properly, I want to just uh, get a basic sense for where you guys are at in terms of your dhamma knowledge and understanding. Is that okay? Can I just ask you a few questions? Okay. So who can tell me? Let's start with something simple. Who can tell me what is Buddhism? No cheating. Okay. No monastics allowed to answer. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? What is Buddhism? It says Buddhist insights. We should be know, know something about Buddhism, please. Um, the teachings of the Buddha. Okay, not too bad, but also not right, because it's not just that, right? There's lots of other things in Buddhism as well. Right? I mean, for example, I run a website, which is a Buddhist website, and it's about the teachings. Of, but the Buddha didn't teach about making websites. Unfortunately, if he had, that would be great, right? Imagine if there was like the Buddhist theory of website design. It would make our job so much easier. <laughs> so Buddhism is the teachings of the Buddha, but also the communities who've been inspired by that, the teachings that they've developed. Uh, it's about it's the life of people. It's the buildings they made, the communities they forged, uh, and the way that the values taught by the Buddha informed and shaped their lives which has happened in so many different ways for two and a half thousand years. Yeah? And so we inherit that tradition and we try to do the same thing. We try to figure out how these teachings, what do they mean, what are they about, and something about how we can live them and how we can apply them. Okay, so let me ask an, another question. Does anybody know what a sutta is? Go on. Buddha's discourses yeah. that he spoke thousands of years ago that were written down by his followers later on after he died. Okay, not too bad. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, so everyone's clear about that? Right. I, I just have to ask these questions because I don't know. Like lots of people don't know these things. So I'm just sort of making sure. Okay, so what else do we got? Okay. Uh, oh yeah, the um, Four Noble Truths. Who can tell me what are the Four Noble Truths? Yes. The first Noble Truth is the truth of suffering. Right. The second Noble Truth is the cause of suffering. Right. The third Noble Truth is that the fact that there is a way out of the suffering. And the fourth Noble Truth is the path that leads to the end of the suffering. Right. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Excellent. So, again, everyone familiar with the Four Noble Truths? Have you heard, has anyone not heard of the Four Noble Truths before? Excellent. So you just heard of the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha's first teaching. Yeah. So the Buddha said that all of his teaching, he said like the elephant's footprint is the greatest of all footprints, and any teaching, any footprint could be included within that, in the same way that all of his teachings can be included in the Four Noble Truths. Okay. So... Uh, <coughs> One of the important things about the Four Noble Truths, of course, the Four Noble Truths begin with suffering. And if, you know, which is why I sort of cracked that Buddhist joke at the beginning of the session, right? Because actually, suffering is why we're here, basically, right? Unless, unless we've like been dragged by our friend and we don't really want to be here anyway, in which case we're, we're suffering because we're here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, most of you, hopefully, we have, we have suffering in our lives. It's a reality. And the Buddha spoke to that suffering. Uh, I once read a, saw a book that said like, the great quotes of mankind. And I thought, oh, what does it say about the Buddha in here? And so on the Buddha, it had the great quote is, there is suffering and there is an origin of suffering. Like only two noble truths. <laughs> and which I would sort of classify as a mediocre thought of mankind, not a particularly <laughs> great one, because the important stuff is that there's a way out. Uh, 
right? So the Buddha's teaching is not a optimistic teaching, it's not a pessimistic teaching, it's a realistic teaching. It's a teaching that responds <coughs> to the way life is and the way that our reality is. Now all of the Buddha's teachings included within the Four Noble Truths, uh, but the Buddha was very uh, inventive and very creative in how he responded to that. And we have a huge variety of different teachings. Uh, sometimes he taught very briefly, sometimes he taught in a lot of detail. In the very first discourse that the Buddha taught, he's t he talked about the First Noble Truth, the truth of suffering, and he summed that up. The Noble Truth of Suffering, he said, in brief, is the five grasping aggregates. Okay? He didn't give any more explanation. He explained what they were in other discourses later on, but in brief, five grasping aggregates. So this is a summary of the Noble Truth of Suffering. Okay? So the, the day long today is going to be trying to learn some more about what he meant by that. Does, does anybody know can anybody tell us what the five aggregates are? You've already answered one, okay. Okay, Hermione, hand down, okay. Body? Smarty. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, that was a Harry Potter joke in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry, yes, please, go on. So, body, physical right. body, right. feelings, right. perception, right. thoughts, mm -hmm. consciousness. <clears throat> Pretty good, okay. Did everyone get that? You want to try it again? Give it, tell us again. Physical body. Yeah. Feelings. Yeah. Perception. Yeah. Thought. Consciousness. Okay. So we will we will um, give some nuances to that later on, but that's a pretty good start. It's a good starting point. Uh, now, the word the five khandas is. I'll give a bit of an overview of these this morning and then this afternoon we'll go into some more detail into each one of these. Uh, so there's somebody who's arriving just in time. She's missed out on all the boring stuff and got here just in time for the real thing. Excellent. So I'll just wait till she comes in. <coughs> Excellent, you're just in time. We've just done all the boring things, so you're just in time for the good stuff. Do you want to come down? There's seats at the front here. There's a, there's a mat here already. There's a mat already, yeah. Excellent. Okay. Now. The five aggregates. Hmm. Now, when no. <laughs> <laughs> timing. When the Buddha talked about the five aggregates the primary context that he, he used this teaching in was in teaching about not-self. Okay, That's the main context. It can be used in a lot of other ways, but that's the main context. So before we get on, can I just ask another question? What does not-self mean? Only those who haven't answered one before? We'll see, what about this side of the room? These guys have been shown their facility. Don't, thank you. Okay, but what? Okay, but what does the uh, what does the word not self? What does the concept of not self actually mean? Can you give me a brief explanation of that? Um, that you know what we think of as ourselves, but I was saying, you know, perception, form, thoughts, and all that are right. permanent. Therefore, they're not worthy of being called self. Okay. They're not. A, they're not a fixed, enduring, permanent self. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Again, pretty good. You guys are doing well, right? Uh, I don't know what I'm doing here, but anyway, that's fine. <laughs> okay, fine. So that's good. 
Okay, so we have the, so the Buddha taught in the suttas, he taught about the Four Noble Truths, he said that the five aggregates comes under the first Noble Truth, the truth of suffering. The five aggregates consist of form, feeling, perception, uh, choices and consciousness and that they uh, are impermanent and because they're impermanent they're not fit to be grasped as a self. Okay, a permanent and enduring self. All right. Something like that. So this basic overall summary, just to give some kind of perspective about what we're going to be talking about. Now, that overview uh, is, uh, you know, is more or less correct, but it misses or it doesn't touch on some of the more like specifics of actually what we're talking about and why we're talking about in this way. The Buddha taught many different frameworks and many different approaches to things, but why this framework in this? approach like why specifically did the Buddha teach in this way and what purpose does this serve within the context of the Buddha's teachings as a whole and then how is that relevant for us so these are some of the questions that I'm hoping to be addressing and answering today there are one seat at the front please come you are just in time <laughs> excellent that's, that's something I learned from Arjun Brahm living with Arjun Brahm when people would come, everyone, everyone would say, oh, they've come late. And Ajahn Brahm would always say, oh, they've come just in time. <laughs> so it's a much more compassionate way of thinking about it. All right. So uh, first thing to bear in mind is that the Buddha rarely uh, <coughs> spoke about the aggregates in isolation. Almost always when the aggregates are being spoken of, he spoke of them as the grasping aggregates. In Pali, the Upadana Kandha, and particularly the five Upadana Kandha, the Pancha Upadana Kandha. Pancha Upadana Kandha. All right. So I'm going to be using a few Pali words today. I will hopefully not use too many, but I will maybe use a few. Actually, uh, maybe for the, I was going to ask maybe this afternoon, do you have a whiteboard? I don't think so. Oh. I, can, I, can just scrib I can just scribble with a marker on the wall, perhaps. No, no. Yeah, maybe in a couple of weeks. Yeah, a couple of weeks uh. <laughs> okay, and it might, if we could find a whiteboard, it might be, I use it sometimes just to put up the party and stuff so people can remember it. Anyway, not, so, not, not necessary right now. Okay, so and the I, I don't usually like to bring in too many Pali words and things in talking because it, it's not really about the language. But in this case, the Pali is quite interesting. Uh, now, the basic word that we're translating as aggregate is the Pali word kandha, right? or the Sanskrit skandha. Right? And skandha or kandha has a more general read meaning of like a section or a category. Sometimes it means something a bit similar to a chapter, like a chapter of a book can be called a kanda. Uh, a, um, it can mean something like a, a trunk of a tree. All right, so something like that. So it has these kind of general meaning of like a, a, a bundle or a, a, a bunch of things which are put together. So in English, we, we typically use the word aggregate to translate kanda. I think aggregate's a reasonable translation. It's not a particularly nice one. I wondered about using bundle. The five grasping bundles. Anyway, I might try it out a few times today and see if that works. Uh, you, you can be my you can be my guinea pigs. Uh, so the bundles or the aggregate. So a bunch of things lumped in together. Okay, but then they are the grasping bundles. Upadana. Kandha. And when we see this translated, we see it sort of translated in a few different ways. Like I think Bhikkhu Bodhi says, like the aggregates of clinging. Is that right? I think his recent subject translations. Or oh, aggregates subject to clinging. Thank you. Yeah. So there's, a f and so there's a few different ways of rendering it. In Pali, when you have a compound, the uh, relationship between the terms and the compound uh, is not determined by the language itself so that it really depends on context so you can actually construe it in a number of different ways okay uh, and then there's pancha it's the five now one of the things which is interesting about this is it draws upon a set of metaphors right so one of the meanings of the kanda in this in this case is like a, a bundle particularly something like a bundle of firewood okay which you can bring, bring and put together 
And so these metaphors of like fire and burning and going out of flame and so on are, are integral to the way that the Buddha talked about things, partly because they're just powerful metaphors, but also partly because they are embedded in a particular cultural context at the time, particularly a context where fire was worshipped. Right? So the, the worship of Agni and the worship of fire is one of the most uh, important parts of the ancient Vedic religion which was prominent in the time of the Buddha. So these are grasping aggregates and there are five of them. Now, when the Buddha taught about these five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, choices and consciousness, right, the number five corresponds to the five fingers of the hand. Right? And this is one of the things which is quite, uh, quite subtle but quite nice in the Buddha's teachings. You have a lot of numerical sets and the, each kind of number that you find has a different, slightly different kind of connotation and symbolic meaning. All right? So if you have, just for example, the number four represents uh, universality. So the Four Noble Truths because it's the four directions. So everywhere. Yeah? The number five, the basic metaphor of the number five is always the hand. Right, the five fingers. And what that means is that the structure of units of five is almost always divided into four plus one, not divided into two plus three. Okay? So just an example, if you're familiar with the five uh, uh, indriyas, for example, uh, the, the Buddha said that wisdom is the, the chief of all of them. In this case, the, the teaching of the five <laughs> aggregates says that all four aggregates, form, feeling, perception, choices, and consciousness, stand, sorry, form, feeling, uh, perception choices stand up against consciousness. Okay, they're all dependent on consciousness. We're going to come back to this later on, but I just want to throw this out there for something you can think of. So consciousness is the thumb. Right? Consciousness is the thumb. Consciousness, which means awareness itself, is what makes all of the other things happen. And that's how you can grasp things. This is why the metaphor of grasping is used here. Because with these five things, we grasp okay, with the thumb. And once we've grasped them, then it can punch you in the face. That's why the panchupadana kanda. Right? <laughs> 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 and then it hurts, right? Panchupadana kanda dukkha. <laughs> Right? It makes sense now. Yeah? <laughs> uh, thank you. A low bar, but thank you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm, I'm using them all up in the beginning stages. So it'll get a lot, a lot more boring later on. Anyway, so, so the Panchu Padanakanda. So now, of course, you won't forget that. Right now, you all kind of remember that the five aggregates, the, the four of them, and the one is the consciousness, and then they punch you, they punch us, cause you suffering. So this is how they work. So when we say the grasping aggregates, actually, the 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 the, the exact meaning and sense of the word grasping has a number of different implications, and I I think that that's intentional. Like I think that it was meant to have a spectrum of possible uh, applications. So but there are th there's three basic meanings to the word grasping in that compound. Number one is that these is, up what the, is upadinna. Upadinna means it is grasped or taken up. So these five aggregates are things which have been taken up. In other words, they're things that we have got through the process of rebirth. They are here. Right? So they've been taken up and, we, and they're present, so upadina. The second thing is upadania, which means that they are subject to, with Bhikkhu Bodhi translates as subject to clinging, so this is what he's translating there is upadania. But I, I don't think quite subject to, to clinging is quite correct there. I think it's more like provokes clinging. Right? So the five aggregates are things that tend to stimulate and provoke clinging and attachment. Right? That's number two. And number three, meaning is that they, they, they are functional, that they are how grasping happens. 
Right? This what is what makes it possible for us to grasp. Like holding on is possible because of how the hand works. Right? So it's the function of how grasping works. So all of those three meanings are there when we're thinking about the idea of the grasping aggregates. So they are things which we have grasped to, we have been attached to, things which right now we are getting more attached to, we're being stimulated to become attached to them more, uh, and they're things that actually tell us how attachment works. All of these things can be found within the idea of the five grasping aggregates. Okay? Everyone with me? We good? Any questions? Please don't hesitate to ask questions. You sure? Okay. One of the very uh, great characteristics of the Buddha's teachings, in fact, began in the Anattalakana Sutta, the second discourses, where the Buddha said, Tanking Manyata Bhikkhave. Yeah? What do you think? All the way through the Buddha's teachings, what do you think? And the Buddha was constantly giving teachings by engaging in dialogue. So don't be afraid to ask questions and don't be afraid to engage in dialogue because you'll learn much better. If you just sit there and go, I haven't got a clue what's going on, <laughs> you're not going to learn anything, right? So you've got to tell me that you don't have got a clue what's going on. Then I can try to help, all right? So, so no, knowing that, we can then add a little bit more uh, specificity to the ideas that we had at the beginning. So the five aggregates are these things, form, feeling, form, feeling, perception, choices and consciousness, rupa, uh, vedna, sanya, sankhara, vijnana, things which uh, we, have, we have grasped through in the past, things that we, we tend to grasp and attach to now, things that make grasping possible to happen. And through these things, we get attached to this idea of a self. So we attach to one or other of these things or combinations of these things as a self. And because we attach to them and hold on to them as a self, we tend to experience suffering. Because the things that we're attaching to don't last. And they don't, they don't give us the lasting happiness that we want from them. And this is why we suffer. Okay? So... Uh, when we began this morning session, we all began by giving away something. Right? So you began this session by relinquishing part of your aggregates and giving it away. Right? And one of the things that you may have noticed, if you were being mindful when you did that, is that when you give something away, it makes you happy. Yeah? Giving makes you happy. Holding on makes you suffer. That is what the Buddha's teaching is all about. So for today, we're going to learn a little bit about how we attach to these things, why we attach to these things, and hopefully we're going to learn to let go of a few things. All right. So... I am thinking that we've we had a bit of an introduction talk already and we're not doing too badly so maybe we could uh, uh, do some meditation. What do you think? Maybe do some meditation? So I'd like to sort of intersperse some meditation and some teaching and things like that. So would you like to do some meditation now? Sure. Yeah? And the reason I have to, uh, you know, I want to ask you <coughs> if, it, if it's okay to do some meditation because uh, my understanding uh, is that this is still uh, a democracy, am I right? <laughs> I mean, I, I checked the news this morning, it seemed a bit iffy, <laughs> but as far as I'm aware, it's still a democracy, yeah? yeah? So you can exercise your right to refuse to meditate if you want. If you don't want to be peaceful, that's fine, it's up to you. <laughs> Seems to be a right that many of us exercise, but yeah. Um, we have a question from someone watching on Facebook. Do you want to appeal that? Hello, person watching on Facebook, how are you going? So they're asking, uh, they say, Hello Bhante, thank you very much for being here. I understand how we grasp and identify with four of the aggregates. Right. But I'm having trouble understanding how we identify with consciousness. Can ah. you give an example to that, please? Thank you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, look, if you, if, you, if you really understand how the other four work, then you're doing pretty 
pretty well. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good already. So congratulations. Uh, as far as consciousness is concerned, the idea. I will talk about more more about this later on. So I won't go into it in detail now because I think we need to understand the basics first. But just very, very briefly, uh, consciousness in the sense that the Buddha talked about is the last bastion of attachment. It's where all our attachment hides and it hides behind our attachment to everything else. And so this is that idea that, that all of these other four aggregates can't really they all depend on consciousness, they all stand against it. So whenever we're attaching to all of these others, there's always this like this, this echo, if you like, of consciousness which is in there. And so when we, through our practice, and especially through meditation practice, what happens is that all of these other aggregates become much more subtle and much more refined and much more still right, through meditation. And in that stillness of those other aggregates, you can begin to catch more and more of a glimpse of what consciousness really is. And you start to see it for what it is. And that's when you can start to let go of what consciousness is. But we'll talk more about that uh, later on, but hopefully we might, we might uh, uh, experience something of that in the meditations. So, uh, t tell me, has, has everyone here meditated before? Is there anyone who's never meditated? No? Everyone's meditated before? Okay. 